as we prepare our hearts for hearing God's word, let's begin with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, once more we gather in your space. Once more we are brought together through technology. Once more we are your people. Surround us with your grace and your love. Open our hearts and our ears that we may hear and respond to your word and be your people from this day forth. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So our gospel lesson for today comes from Matthew's gospel. Matthew has a series of passages circling around the event of the Palm Sunday entry of Christ that reflect the tension of Jesus' message to the establishment in which he proclaimed it. And so today's is a parable in which he's responding back to those in power with an alternate vision of God's kingdom and God's love. So this is a parable from Matthew chapter 22, the first 10 verses. Listen for God's word. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a ruler who gave a wedding banquet for the heir. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. So again the ruler sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready, so come now to the wedding banquet." But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to her business, while the rest seized these servants and mistreated them and killed them. The ruler was enraged and so sent troops to destroy those murderers and burn their city. And then the ruler said to his workers, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. So go therefore into the main streets, the crossroads, and invite everyone that you can find to the wedding banquet. The servants went out into the streets, and they gathered all whom they found, both the good and the bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're going to start with a question And the question is this, is the Bible only for us when things are going well, when things are pleasant and comfortable, or does Scripture speak to us when times are hard? I want you to think about the wildfires in California right now, and imagine that you're a homeowner seated on perhaps a charred wall while behind you, your entire house has been destroyed. Or maybe in Louisiana, you're standing on a water-soaked porch where the entire house and its contents have been destroyed by the floodwaters. In those moments, can you still read the Bible? In those times, can you still find comfort in the gospel? The Bible may most commonly be read on Sunday mornings in comfortable places of worship, But the message goes out into a world that knows both joy and sorrow. So reading the Bible today are people whose homes have been burnt or flooded. Reading the Bible are people who have maybe just lost a family member or a job. People like you and me who carry within us wounds from yesterday and anxieties for tomorrow. And so it is still true today just as it was true back in the days of Matthew. Matthew was writing his gospel around the year 70 CE. He was living in a time when there were incredible tensions between the Jewish authorities that were in charge of the temple and the daily life of people, and tension with these upstarts, followers of Jesus, Jewish Christians worshiping in home churches. And then suddenly, The entire capital city was overrun by the Romans and destroyed, burnt, buildings torn down, and the temple desecrated. In that setting, Matthew chose to pull together and tell the gospel story. So there in the ruins of a once beautiful city, Matthew wept and was angry and frustrated. 
and wrote down these series of chapters and the parable of a troubling wedding banquet. So I want to profess, Scripture does talk to us in times that are both good and bad, both when we're comfortable and safe and in power and when we're frustrated and persecuted and perplexed. In all settings, what we have before us is a life-giving gospel, a gospel intended for all people. But the gospel still has to be heard honestly, even when its message challenges us, when it reminds us that there's work to be done between today and that great dawning of God's realm of glory. So, once upon a time, a ruler determined to form and gather together the people for a great banquet. And invitations went out to call the entire community together. And everything was of the finest quality and there was plenty for all. But the invitations were rejected, spurned. Over and over again, the servants went forth with the message, but people gave them excuses. No, I'm too busy. So they went back again and described the banquet, but they were treated poorly, told, what need do I have of this banquet? I already have my fill. The servants continued to go out, but they were beaten and abused and murdered. And there's much even in this old story from Matthew's time that reflects our own national history. Tomorrow was a holiday, one that until recently we called Columbus Day, but now we recognize as Indigenous Peoples Day. Columbus Day is actually a fairly new national holiday. It was only made a holiday officially in 1937 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Columbus himself honestly is a somewhat murky figure. We believe, or he's reported, to have been born in Genoa, Italy, but many scholars doubt that. The reality is, is that his prime identity throughout much of his life was actually Portuguese and Spanish. He married a Portuguese noblewoman, and he spent almost his entire career serving the Spanish king and queen. But even more troubling than his unclear history is his clear record of combining exploration with exploitation and slavery. So on October 12th, 1492, Columbus first landed on a small island in the Caribbean Sea. And on that island, he encountered the Lucayan people. And before his very first day was complete, he had already captured six of them to be made into slaves. From that island, he moved on to the land of Hispaniola, and he began there a pattern that continued for all of his voyages, to capture men, women, and children who would then be transported back and sold as slaves in Spain. So our holiday focus has shifted from Cristoforo Colón, which actually is probably his real name, it's how he signed all of his documents in Spain, to instead honoring the indigenous people of North America. But even to raise up that topic recognizes that our treatment of native peoples in North America is troubling. There's a long litany of broken promises and illegal land acquisition, of forced cultural assimilation and murder. As Kelly Boer shared in her video and reminds us, the native cultures are vibrant but for centuries they've been treated as enemies and their culture was suppressed by a dominating European colony mentality. Despite the very real potential that the cultures could have lived and learned and thrived together on a shared continent. So similar to Matthew's allegory, America, a land capable of providing a rich banquet for all, became a nation prone to abusing God's messengers, those who would call for a beloved community, and a culture here that too often would kill those who would challenge the white culture's power. And so that brings us back to the parable itself. What was the response to the, of the ruler, the lord of the banquet, when faced with all the people's rejections? 
Well, whether back in the day of Matthew with the city of Jerusalem lying in ruins or in modern times where we acknowledge the attacks on native people and the lingering legacies of slavery and Jim Crow and racism, despite it all, a persistent invitation still goes out calling us to gather for God's wedding banquet. The invitations go out to the highways and byways, the crossroads and the alleys of our communities. And it goes out saying the banquet is there for all. And it's there whether you're dealing with wildfires and floods, whether you're dealing with slavery or racism or sin, still one consistent message is proclaimed. The feast, the feast is ready. Go into the streets, invite everyone to the banquet so that by grace, our communities, our land might be healed. I recently had an argument, well, maybe a theological disagreement, with one of my colleagues in Pittsburgh Presbytery. At the last Presbytery meeting, I voted against ordaining one of the candidates for ministry because of his non inclusive judgmental theological views. And only a handful of us voted against him. But my opposition was noted by another minister who felt compelled and wanted to talk to me about my vote. And so we met, and we quickly got onto the topic of discussing how Jesus washes away our sins, how Jesus is the propitiation for our unrighteousness. And to explain his position, my colleague told the following allegory, parable. He said, imagine there was a man who had a large front yard that was a beautiful public space for all the neighbors and the children to enjoy. But one day, a teenage boy drove his truck through that yard, spinning circles, tearing up the sod, destroying the landscape. The landowner was furious, and he ordered the boy to fix the yard the way it was before. But the boy was young. He had no tools. He had no expertise. He was totally unable to repair the damage to the yard. But at that point, the property owner's son stepped forward, and he offered to repair all the damage caused by the reckless youth. Now, my colleague concluded by suggesting that this was an example of how Jesus steps in and repairs the damage and washes away our sin and restores the broken relationship between us as individuals and with God. So I listened carefully, but then I offered this rebuttal, and I reminded my colleague that sin is never just an individual act. The young man who thoughtlessly wrecked the yard harmed the entire community as well. He likely went against the wishes of his own parents. He destroyed a place of beauty that was meant to be a playground for children and a park enjoyed by all. He'd abused his privilege and his wealth by recklessly driving a four-wheel vehicle simply because he had the power and the chance to do so. And yes, it's true, he defended the landowner, but just as grievous, he'd wounded and damaged the community. Jesus didn't die and then rise from the grave just to wash away one man's sin. Jesus died and rose again so that our relationship with God and with one another might be healed, that we together might once more be a loving community before God that we might finally sit together at God's wedding banquet table. And that, that is the actual power of Matthew's little parable. When they were told to go out again after all that had happened and reissue the invitation to the banquet, the servants did so. And they didn't pick and choose. Their work out there wasn't just to save one boy over there or one girl over there. The work as scripture says, was such that they gathered all whom they found, both the good and the bad, and so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now, 
How we respond to that invitation is still important. It does have consequences. If you refuse to step over the threshold into the banquet hall, then that's a poor use of your God-given free will. If you enter into that banquet hall, but your choice is to treat others rudely and claim false privileges over them, then that's being disrespectful and dishonoring sinfully the invitation of a gracious host. But the point is that invitation is given to us individually so that we might be better communally. An initial act of personal generosity that's designed to evoke a common, grateful response of kindness, love, and faith lived out together. Years ago, the poet Archibald MacLeish said this, quote, democracy is never a thing done. Democracy is always something that a nation must be doing. What is necessary now is that democracy become again a democracy in action, unquote. Now that sentiment is certainly true given today's election cycle, but it's also true if we would put those words and apply them to faith. Faith is not something that is over and done with, something claimed, put in our pocket, and then forgotten. Faith is a verb. Faith is an action, something that we must be doing as individuals and as a community. And at the heart of this call to action is the invitation from God to come together, good and bad alike, powerful and powerless alike, and sit together at the banquet table, not for us to choose the guest list, but for us to join and share in the meal provided by God's grace. And at its heart, that's why the gospel can be read in so many different settings. Matthew could write about that healing banquet table even as he sat in a city destroyed and in ruins. People can reassure themselves after wildfires and floods and personal loss, hearing once more the comforting words of Jesus who said, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As Americans, we can repent of how the very places we gather for worship are built upon stolen native lands, including our own church. Trusting, though, that as we acknowledge and repent of that, there's also the hope that we will still find ways to come together by God's grace and sit at one table. Because the invitation is still going forth The opportunity to respond, to act, to join together as the body of Christ is very much alive. So be not afraid. Be not troubled. In all times and in all places together, let us give thanks to God. Amen.